I was good at doing the movements, I was a natural athlete, but it took me years to learn how to put that together. Hello, everybody. Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 382. Today, my guest is Professor James Southwood. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host on this show. I'm the founder at Whistlekick, where we've got whistlekick.com and a bunch of stuff that we make. Uniforms and protective gear and fun shirts and sweatshirts. Just, just a whole bunch of stuff for you to tell the world, hey, I'm a martial artist. I love training. and this is my life. So check it out over there. You can find a lot of our stuff also at Amazon. And we'd love for you to check out the show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can sign up for the newsletter there and find out everything that we've got going on with this show that we bring you twice a week, all for free. Today's guest, if I had to put one word to describe him, is a philosopher. And for anyone who's spent time in philosophy classes or considering the philosophical aspects of the world or of martial arts, you know that there's a tremendous amount of insightful thought that happens. And of course, that description is pretty accurate, as far as I'm concerned, for Professor Southwood. We talked about a lot of the surface elements of martial arts, maybe surface is the wrong word, the external elements, there we go. But we also talked a lot about internal things, thoughts and philosophy, beliefs. And it really all came together into what I truly enjoyed as our conversation. So I hope you also enjoy this. Professor Southwood, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hi there. Thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me on. Of course, of course. Thank you for coming on. You, and, and, and we'll get into this a little bit later, I'm sure, but you hold the distinction of being the first professor that we've had on the show and the first true representative of your principal style anyway and uh and, and and i always like to dangle that that carrot in front of the listeners we don't have to talk quite a bit about that yet but what i what i want to tell the audience is that we just spent like a great 10 minutes talking about things completely unrelated to martial arts and and it i've got a feeling that we're gonna have a great chat today me too yeah yeah so we we kind of start in, in what some people think is, is kind of a boring way to start, but it's, I, I see a lot of parallels between what we do to start and what we do in martial arts to start, which is very fundamental, basic things. So the most basic question I can ask you, of course, is how did you find martial arts? I've pondered this several times because I'm coming up to my 20-year anniversary now. And in a way, I can't tell you. It's strange that, but I, it was at university my second year, and I went along to, uh, I responded to a flyer that was handed out for uh, kickboxing that wasn't going to hurt, because that was a thing for me. And I went along, and it turned out to be Savat, which is the sport I've been in ever since. And I can't really tell you what the, the penny drop moment was when I knew I was going to stick with it. I just went along to one class, I wanted to go back to the second, went to the second, wanted to go to the third, and, and here I am 20 years later. So it's not so much a story of some dramatic moment that started me off, but I got started. But I imagine at some point as a child, you were aware of martial arts, at least. I mean, we established prior to the show that we're the same age. So I, I can't imagine having grown up and not knowing what martial arts was. So you starting as an adult, as a young adult, there's probably a story in there. I think it was more about learning a physical skill. I've always been attracted to learning skills. Like I, I learned to juggle when I was a, when I was a kid. It, it appeals to me to be able to have mastery over my body in that way. And if I hadn't got into martial arts, I'd have probably got into dance or to gymnastics, something like that. And I, w I went to a school that wasn't big on promoting physical activity in kids. It didn't like the competitive aspect of that. It was big on music, which I'm no good at, uh, and drama, which I was okay at. But it wasn't until I got to university that I was able to say, I want to do a physical sport and learn to get good at something. And in a sense, it didn't matter what I chose. And I'm very pleased I chose martial arts because I think I could have got bored doing something that was 
not as difficult as this. Uh, doing boxing, which is like what I call it more than I call it martial arts, I call it boxing. It's always difficult. It doesn't matter 20 years in, I still find it difficult. I'm still learning how to deploy my body properly, how to, uh, how to make certain movements happen, how to teach those movements to other people. So the journey has been one of learning physical skills and finding there's no end to that. That's what, that's what I've been involved in, I think. Now, when you, when you say you refer to what you do more as boxing than as martial arts, tell me what you mean. Okay. So literally martial arts would refer to something that was warlike, Mars being the god of war. And something like Savat is boxing. It's always been a sport or, as it started off, a method of dueling. So it was never martial. It was never warlike. And the French call it French boxing, box française. And it's very, it's important to me not to follow them into that too much and give them all the credit for it. So we use the name they give it, which is Savat. And Savat is a form of boxing, which uses the shoe. Savat is their word for, for an old shoe. And I see it as that. I don't see it as martial arts where you learn to, to live and die in that sense. I see it as a sport in which you learn to do things within a set of parameters. That's why I call it boxing. Now, when we think about martial arts today, obviously it has those, those roots, you know, that, that martial, that warlike tradition that kind of comes forward for all of us. But I, I don't know anyone personally that is engaged in practicing karate or taekwondo or kung fu because they're expecting to go to war at any moment. So I, I think you'd probably join me in, in, in saying we can shift the definition of martial arts a little bit, you know, kind of modernizing it. And I'm curious if, if we do that, do you still separate Savat from that definition? I would, I would definitely join you in, a, in the project of saying that it doesn't need to be Martian in a literal sense. But because a lot of what I do is introducing people to the sport, I want to give them the right expectation. And I think the right expectation is to call it a boxing art rather than a martial art, in that we fill a studio or a boxing gym where there are heavy pads and guys knocking the hell out of a bag and sweat and gloves and pads, rather than an airy dojo with bare feet and that sort of atmosphere. It's, it's much more the boxing atmosphere than a traditional martial arts atmosphere, which is why I, why I continue in the distinction even though I accept it, so it, a modernized term. Interesting stuff. So you, you, you went, and then you went back, and you just continued to go back, and here you are 20 years later. But I'm sure at some point, even if you don't remember in the early days why you kept going back, there must have been some point in time, maybe a year in or five years in or even 10 years in, where you looked up and you said, this is a thing, a pursuit that I've put a lot of time into. And I want to continue to put that time in. Was that ever a, a conscious internal discussion? I think it came about earlier than perhaps I told you the last time. It came about when the, on the, the, I went back to the second class, kind of for the reason that I'd boxed with this Frenchman on the first class, and I wanted to get the better of him the next time, which I think tells you a bit about how competitive I can be. and why I do so much competition still. So it was that pursuit of trying to get good at this better, better than the next guy that I was, uh, that got me hooked. Yeah. So the hook I can recall is a moment when I, I did want to outbox somebody. Um, after I finished university, I quit for about a year, year and a half, or rather I moved somewhere where I couldn't train and I did come back to it. So at that point, it was definitely a conscious decision. This is my sport. I put a few years into this. I want to continue it. So yeah, there were two moments at least when I can say, I, I know why I did it. Now, if we were to go back and, and observe you as a child, you mentioned your desire, your penchant for tackling physical skills. You mentioned juggling and your want to master them. What else other than juggling? You know, you said music wasn't quite your thing. Drama wasn't so much your, your, your passion. But was there anything else as a child that might give us some foreshadowing towards 
your pursuit of Savat survi- as an adult? Hard to answer, but I would think it's more my philosophical bent because I didn't have an outlet until university where I could choose my sport. I was very good at swimming, which shows that I th- I'm a natural athlete. I was able to swim well. My family did that. But when I got to choose my sport, it took until I was you know, 19, 20 years old before I could do that. But as a child, I was very philosophical. So I've managed to find a sport that marries a philosophy with a way of movement, which is why it still engages me to the level it does. And we're going to go back to your martial arts boxing distinction because martial arts are what are traditionally associated with a philosophy. Boxing tends not to or could be considered secular if that's uh, the way of describing it. But definitely my philosophical way of uh, way of thinking, way of conceiving of the world plays into why I still do this sport at this level. How far into your training were you when you discovered that there was that philosophical element? Well, I was studying philosophy at university at the time, and I was drifting a long way from Western philosophy. I picked up Shenryu Suzuki's Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, which I'm not sure how many of your listeners will have read it. I can heartily recommend that they do so. So for the first few years, I was using a lot of Zen and Eastern thought to complement my physical training, which came unpackaged by anything like that. So very early on, I was marrying uh, a philosophical side with a training side. Edit point. Do you want me to continue going on to other philosophies or do you want to ask me another question? Let it let it ride. If you want to continue, I, I, I suspect that us talking about philosophy is going to be a big part of our, our conversation today. So take that however however far you want to. I'll leave that answer with, with what you asked me, which was how early on. And I think I think I gave that. Okay, sure. We're already getting some hints around philosophy, and, and I, I guess we can call them far more than hints. You know, you attending university for philosophy, and you've described your physical pursuit, your, your sport, your savat training now as having a philosophical element. For a lot of martial artists that I speak with, the philosophy tends to be an afterthought in their early training, but it tends to become much more forefront as they advance. Can we say the same of you? I think so. Um, I think that's fair to say that the, the more you practice something, the more you, want, you ask questions as to how it's happening and why it's happening. So it tends to be action first, philosophy later, and then later on the reverse. If you were to ask me whether that's a good thing or not, I, I don't know whether we should introduce people to the philosophy earlier or let their training find it as they get better or as they seek their own way. Well, I, I suspect based on the size of the philosophy house at the university I attended, that if we were to move the philosophical elements of martial arts a bit more forefront and early on, we might see even lower participation. I, I guess so. Most people phone me up because they want to learn how to defend themselves on the street, not because they want to learn how to um, uh, resolve some sort of tension in themselves. Now, we've talked about Savat as if everyone listening knows what it is. I, I've, I'm fortunate enough to have trained a little bit with a Savat instructor um, at some seminars and, and gotten to know who he is. But I'm aware that not everyone listening may know what Savat is, French. French. Boxing, you know what? What, what yep. is this? So maybe you could offer a, a bit of a summary for everyone. Sure. So savat is French boxing. The French call boxing with the hands box anglaise, English boxing, whereas the French use their feet as well. And if you think about how agile a boxer is, they move their fists very quickly. They understand the lines that they're attacking and defending on. French boxers do that with their feet also. And whenever I say that to people, they say, oh, that's like kickboxing. And I say, actually, kickboxing is a 1970s pretty much invention. And French boxing has been going on since about 1830. It was before that, probably. It was codified in about 1830. Then they say, oh, is that like Thai boxing? And the distinction between Savat and Thai boxing is mainly the use of the shins. Thai boxers hit with a shin, French boxers hit with their shoes. So 
you get a picture of French boxing as a very agile, fluid art. And because the rules only permit you to use the shoe, you must be very aware of your distance, very aware of your timing. And those constraints make quite a lovely sport. It is a sport. It's a boxing sport. It happens in a ring. It happens with a referee, with rules, that sort of thing. Um, there are other disciplines beside it. Boxing is the most popular, popular one, but you can also do savat form, which is savat set to music where you don't hit anyone, if, you, if that's your thing. You can do kanda combat, which is the same movements as savat boxing, but you use a stick instead. Grand baton, bigger stick, or savat defense, which is the self-defense side. So depending where you go, savat can be a complete martial art, as it were, with weapons, self-defense, and sport. I tend to focus on the boxing. That's been my interest, my passion. That's what I'm good at, and that's what I teach. Interesting. I, I did not know the, the history. I didn't know it had been established so long ago. I had assumed it was kind of parallel with, um, you know, with, with kickboxing. Yeah, well, the, the history has got more intrigue than that because uh, there is, I don't know if everyone in the world listening will appreciate it, but England and France being such close neighbors, of course, is rivalry. And the English fighters used their fists, they understood pugilism, and the French fighters used their feet. And of course, each one thought the other was crazy. Okay? The English think the French, uh, they, they, they use their feet, that's been on the floor, it's very dirty. And the French would think the English are uncouth, it's, it's unartistic and, and too simple to use your hands. Uh, and always with these things, it takes one bright spark to put the two together. The story goes that in about 1830, a Frenchman traveled to London and was beaten by an English boxer. And it is perhaps only a story, but that's the founding story. And from that, the first uh, salle, the first uh, training saloon of Savat Box Francaise was created. Now I'm I'm curious if if the codification of savat was kind of steeped in these these cultural roots and in perhaps that the 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 resistance to anything English does that find its way into the rules or any of the stylistic elements you know the favoritism of of say feet over hands that last part is true, but I'm, I'm not sure if it's for the, the reasons you suppose that kicks are more highly valued than punches when you're judging a, about or when you're um, examining someone. But the rules find their, uh, the, the codification by taking essentially the Marcus of Queensby rules for boxing with the French rules for kicking. So you get occasional mismatches in which it is illegal to punch to the back, but it is legal to kick to the back. There's a little uh, stitching point of the rules that hasn't quite resolved, but people don't tend to see it in these dichotomized terms when you're practicing. You're just doing boxing with your hands and your feet. Have you had much opportunity to, uh, I guess, cross train or to, to train with folks in other disciplines? Yeah, I do a lot of English, what I'm going to call English boxing, by which I mean boxing with the hands only. So I've trained with all sorts of coaches over the years in different places, you know, underground boxing gyms, amateur boxing, that sort of stuff. And that always helps. I like the way those coaches operate. If you find a good boxing coach, I like the way the discipline is instilled and I like the movements that come about. So I've trained a lot of boxing. I did five years of Thai boxing in a, in a good gym in London, which it teaches you how to defend yourself a little bit, teaches you different ways through sparring, different ways to use your range. So I think that's my cross training, boxing, mm -hmm. bit of Thai boxing and training and, and competing with people all over the world in Savat. The various, various countries come to you with different ways of doing the sport. And in 20 years, I've seen it change and evolve. It's not quite the same sport as it was when I first saw it. Well, let's talk about that competition and some of the ways that things have changed. You mentioned early on in our conversation that you were a competitive person and 
that kind of being the reason that you went back to your second class. Are you still competing now? I do still compete now. Okay. The, now, we haven't had too many people on the show who have spent 20 years competing in, in their martial arts or martial pursuit or whatever you want to call it. So what is it that keeps you coming back to, to competition? Sure. Well, I think my, my overall goal in martial arts is to be like some of the people I see. Uh, there are veteran tournaments in Savat in which people who are aged 60 or 70 still compete. And they still compete effectively because the movements are pretty sensible. Uh, there's no undue stress on the knees or uh, if you've trained sensibly across your career, there's no reason why you can't do it quite well when you're 60 or 70. So I still intend to be competing uh, in another 20 years time. This is a nice bit about Savat. One of the ways in which I think it differs from kickboxing is that it's playful. You are introduced to sparring very early on and you are encouraged or, or given the tools to make it a playful pursuit rather than only an aggressive one. You can learn aggression later on and some people, of course, are more aggressive than others, but it's fundamentally play. So you can play and you can keep playing for 20 years and not have a, a problem with it. I think I enjoy competition because it does give you that knife edge of does this work or doesn't it? There's a, especially, uh, especially in the political world in the last couple of years, it's come to the forefront. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of mistrust of public information. There's a lot of ways in which we're beginning to ask questions about um, facts and about science and so forth. What I like about boxing is that if something doesn't work, you can see it doesn't work. If someone tells you to do something, but they can't demonstrate it working, it doesn't work. So competition is that knife edge that cuts away anything that isn't useful. Um, I didn't mean to paraphrase Bruce Lee there, but you can see where both concepts come from. Tell us a bit about the way competition has changed. I want to answer that in kind of two ways. But the reason I'm cautious is that, of course, I've changed a lot in the last 20 years, so I don't know how reliable my observation is. <laughs> um, I, I think that's true of, of, of all of us when we compare things. I, I, sure. isn't, isn't that the root of, of how we, we look back favorably on everything? Everything was better in the past? Oh, yeah. Um, I, but I do think there are some fundamental changes that have occurred as well. Uh, for example, when I started, it was such a French-dominated sport that their methods and their technique predominated over everything. And since then, there's been a lot of competition directed at them from Eastern Europe, from, um, from my country, from other places that have changed what is effective when you fight. So it was a lot more technical and a lot more kick-based when we started. And it's a little more boxing-based and I, I'd know slightly less flowery, florid, I'm going to say, slightly less florid style predominates now. Um, although I suppose like everyone who's been doing it 20 years, one considers oneself old school. Um, I like to think that I can still do the florid techniques that used to win prizes. For me, I'm not, I don't think I'm naturally a fighter. Now, you probably didn't invite me on to tell you to a martial arts interview to say I'm not a fighter, but I, th I think that's pretty true of me. I didn't enjoy boxing or competing very much, and I wasn't very good at defending myself or, uh, or hitting other people when I started. So I had to learn all of those bits of competition piece by piece. I had to you know, learn how to defend, learn how to move my head a bit. And it took me ages to learn that I could actually be any good at it. What was your mindset during during that time? Because I, I I sense, you know, just just connecting some dots about you. I I get the sense that you might be fairly hard on yourself if if you're not getting something at the rate that you think you should. So during that that early time when, you know, maybe you didn't feel as naturally inclined towards some of the aspects of this this sport that you've chosen. I, I guess is that difficult. I don't think it was, um, uh, and I think it's because I, I allowed myself to define myself as a technician rather than a fighter, as someone who could complete the movements and understood them, but 
wasn't naturally that effective in the ring. But like I say to most of my students as they start, because most of them need this assurance, you always start off good at something and you have to learn the rest. Some people on their first day are, have amazing balance and you can't rock them and they're just going to get, they're going to be balanced you know, from, the, from day one. Other people come with a natural inclination to, to box and move their head and they're, they're good at that. Other people just get their timing right from day one. You always start with something and the rest you have to learn. And in my case, I was good at doing the kicks. I was good at doing the movements. I was a natural athlete, but it took me years to learn how to put that together in, in a boxing sense, in, a, in, a, in the way of making it work as a fight strategy. And so I don't think I was that harsh on myself. I just allowed myself to self-define as a technician rather than a fighter. And I learned that skill second. Do you think it would have been better in any way or easier? Or, or let me ask you a different way. What do you think your experience would have been like if the opposite had been true? What if you had been more inclined towards the, the combat? What if you had had more of that instinct, but less technical skill early on? That's a hard one to answer in one's own case. It, other people I've seen who come in with that skill set tend to get set in their habits. They tend to uh, have, have some success with the skills they do have and get obsessed with fighting better, more combat, more uh, uh, relying on instinct more and more. And you can see it in old boxers who uh, haven't got it anymore but still rely on their, their battle, you know, their warrior instinct. And I dare say the same fate would have befallen me. If I was very good at moving, you'd end up not learning the, the more accurate ways of getting the technique right. You end up shortcutting here and there because you're quite good at getting out of trouble. So I dare say this was the better way round to learn it, at least in my case. I'm going to throw you potentially a curveball, and I apologize for doing so, because I didn't know that I was going to have a... Martial philosopher, or whatever I might refer to you as in our conversation today. When you consider the intersection for you of your training and, and, and philosophy, what is the greatest philosophical dilemma that you see in front of you? Uh, I, that I see in front of me now, or that I've seen in the, in the past? Uh, either, wh wh whichever one's going to lead us to a better conversation. Mm -hmm. I think the, the greatest dilemma philosophically facing, facing me and facing other students of the sport is the difference, the gap between what people are capable of doing in inverted commas and what they end up doing. There are a whole host of philosophical and psychological reasons why people do not do what they are capable of doing. And the methods by which they hold themselves back is, is both a great philosophy of what it is to be a human being and to deal with your own barriers and, and obstacles. And it's a method of psychology for how to help somebody do that. So everyone I teach, you know, from the first beginner to someone who's about to be a champion, they are dealing with the fact that there is a gap between what they're probably capable of getting accomplished in this next fight and what they will end up doing through reasons of you know, maybe they don't think they're up to it. Maybe they're bottle it at the last moment. Maybe they're too tense on fight day. All of these reasons contribute to that gap. And in a sense, I see myself, my role as a coach, as reducing that gap. And that's also what I spend the time on in my own career. How can I reduce the gap between what I can do and what I end up doing. And that's what most of my philosophy is directed at. Can you talk to us about some of the strategies that you use with the athletes as a coach to reduce that gap? I'm going to start by talking about something I've used on myself, and then I'll consider if I've managed to effectively help anyone else with it. I was, uh, I think, in the position prior to 2014, most of the, my teammates and I, we had a really good time at tournaments and we always had a laugh and some of us would win medals, but we didn't really see ourselves as people who would go and win these tournaments. And it was part of the group setup that that was what we did. And it's a bit of a British underdog 
mentality. And that was the gap. The gap was that it was outside of our expectations to win a tournament and become a champion, but it was within our expectations to go and win a medal and do very well and get praise and, and, and congratulations afterwards. So the method I used on myself was to, separate, to identify that and separate myself off from my teammates for one tournament and do it my way and not come in with the saddled with this expectation that we're there to come and win a bronze or silver if we're lucky, but actually go and win a gold. And by ignoring the social pressure to come second or third, I came first. And maybe it was the only point in my life, but for one day of my life, I did perform at the absolute maximum of my ability. I reduced the gap to just about zero. And it's things like that that I think I try and it'd be different for every student, but every student has got some reason that's holding them back. And for me, it was this participation in this group thing that said, we're good for bronze and silver, but we're not good for gold. And I think I, for at least one night, I managed to get rid of it. I've spent enough time myself competing, whether it's in martial arts or in other things that I, I what you're talking about here with this gap between one's potential and one's actual performance, I, that, that gap is so real. And it, it's such an amazing thing to be able to reduce that gap and to have that experience. Because once you've done it once, not only are you, at least in my experience, better able to get back there again, but it can almost be addictive, right? Because we're, we're so used to existing and performing at that one level, that reduced level, that that becomes our, our awareness, our self-talk that's who we are yes. in our place in the world and then we reach that that other stage and it gives a whole new perspective on who we really are as individuals i often say to people you've heard of cuz d'amato who was um mike tyson's trainer he said something interesting he said boxing is all about fear you can teach anyone to hit a bag people can learn how to be fair and go for runs but if they can't control their fear, they're not going to be good at boxing. And this is where the intersection between philosophy and martial arts of boxing comes into it, because so much of that is how do you live your life um, free from fear, you know, free from worry for the next thing that happens to you or any kind of fear like this. This is that's the ultimate liberation in a way. And um, I did it twice, I now realize, because I did a couple of years after winning that title, put myself in that same mindset and accomplish what you just described, which is this sense that actually you're a changed person and you have access to this place where you're not set by these limits. And in a sense, the addiction for me has been in trying to show other people that. In as a coach, putting someone else in that position and showing them what it can really be like. Uh, that's that's the hook for me. Why? Why? What is, what is it about that feeling or that situation that is, is addictive in a sense? There's a freedom from tension, which is usually what guides us to do what we do in the world. And that freedom from tension, uh, you're asking me, you know, what's the meaning of life in a way, which is a question I don't feel qualified to answer. But if you, if you can reach these 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 moments of freedom these numerous moments of uh, release from your normal expectations it's just a glimpse of something different and you can coach yourself and coach other people to being able to behave that way uh, it's an open and unanswered question for me whether that's possible all the time or whether you experience it only in moments or whether you can train yourself to do it more frequently i, I don't know Quite often when we have guests on the show, we'll talk about, you know, the high points, the, the good stuff, how they start, you know, things like that. But I'm always interested about kind of the other end of the spectrum. Because to me, martial arts has always been a tool set that I can use, not just for fun and for, for positive reasons, but it can be useful to avoid negative things. I'd love to hear about some time in your life when martial arts was able to do that for you? To avoid something negative. Um, 
Yeah, and, and people answer that in a lot of different ways. Sometimes sure. it's well, you know we have stories about physical confrontation or or well, uh, things that are less. I spend a, I, I spend a lot of time these days on Stoic philosophy, and it's a it's a saying of Seneca that misfortune is virtue's opportunity. That for everything that goes wrong, it's a chance to show what you have to do, what you can do about it, what you bring to that, and and I truly believe that. The reason I pause was because the some point in 2014 I was in a training gym in Paris and I almost quit the sport I've been doing it for 15 years at the time and I was so frustrated that this club uh, I couldn't do what I wanted to do in this club and they didn't let me spar with the good people at the back and I was kind of being I felt like I was kind of being laughed at by someone and that sort of negative feeling is gold dust because you can go into it and work out exactly what's bothering you. And if you can work out what's bothering you, you can either get around it or do something better. And that's what I did. And a few months later, I was world champion. So I never stress too much about these negative moments or if something negative happens to me, or I think, hang on. And it still happens. You have a day when you think, I'm awful at this sport. I can't do this. I don't know why I even started. You feel that for a moment or for longer, and it shows you what to do next. So I'm always open to these experiences now because it does give you the next clue. Do you find that the frequency of those moments ever reduces? Or does the self-talk just change? I think the self-talk changes, but I think it's a, a mistake to rely too heavily on past accomplishments because I think that way you, you, you start to get the wrong impression of yourself and you can start to believe your own hype or your own, uh, uh, your own story. It's, boxers are harsh on themselves. There's a, a boxing maxim that says you're only as good as your last fight. They're kind of right. It's kind of wrong as well. And I kind of think it never, ever goes away. You'll always have self-doubt and it'll always be part of what it is to be a human being or a martial artist to have that self-doubt. And I think as you get older or as you get more experienced, you just learn to, you learn to operate with it in a different way. For me, the self-doubt continues, right? And, and, and I think as much as I've tried to shed it, it becomes a, tied into my motivation. You know, if, if I was constantly satisfied with where I was at, I, I wouldn't know why I was moving forward. You know, it almost seem, seem pointless. And sometimes that voice gets really loud and, and you know, will kind of take over and tell me that, yeah, why, why did I even bother starting this? I'm terrible at this, you know, whatever it is. Unfortunately, it's, it's about more than just martial arts. It can be literally anything that I'm, I'm dealing with. But then I've, I've got enough experience, I guess, listening to that voice, hearing what it's saying and kind of flipping it, using it as fuel to prove to myself that I am good enough. Is it similar for you at all? I can relate to exactly the way you've said that. Yes. And that's kind of what I meant by you, you operate on it differently the older you get because you'll get a sudden rush of self-doubt or something goes wrong and you think, hang on, I really should have been able to handle that or, you know, so-called world champion, how come you didn't manage to, to touch that guy? Whatever it is, it comes to you, but I've learned to have a dialogue with myself in a much more rational way. So I can take that incoming information and ask myself, well, is that true, first of all? And if it's not, then maybe it's just a feeling that will go. Then you can ask yourself, well, it is true. Why is it true? Why is it true that I couldn't lay a glove on this guy? And you start to, or I start to work out, maybe I'm standing in slightly the wrong place for that type of fighter. Maybe I haven't got my eyes in the right place or my gloves up, those sorts of things. So you there's no end to that sort of learning. And that harks back to what I said 
lecture a while ago when I said it never becomes easy to box. You're always two people moving around, trying to do something pretty gymnastic, whilst the other guy or girl is trying to punch you in the face. That's never an easy equation. So I now know to let myself off the hook if I can't get it just right. And I know how to use that information to make myself a better boxer or understand a little bit more the next time. Now, we, we talked a little bit earlier about, um, you know, you, you mentioned a book that some of the listeners might be familiar with, but you didn't sound too fond of it. Let's, let's think of it the other way. Are there books that our listeners might be interested in, whether they're martial arts books or not, that you think, you know, could be relevant to the audience? I, sure. First, I want to make, make my, uh, my thoughts clear on, on Shenryu Suzuki and his Zen mind, <laughs> beginner's mind. That is, that is an excellent book that I keep returning to. And so I recommend it a second time to your, to your listeners. And in terms of, it's, it's hard to make book recommendations, I think, in general, because you don't know who your audience is. Um, sure. as, as, to each, as to each element, a specific medicine. And for me, that has been first Zen in the form of um, Shinryu Suzuki and some others, later existentialism. And I read a lot of Soen Kierkegaard, who writes on anxiety. And, you know, ask anyone with a serious understanding or a serious experience of martial arts, anxiety is one of the key things to understand. And Soen Kierkegaard was a a Danish 19th century philosopher, and I've read most of him on that. If you can pick up a work by Kierkegaard, then I think you're on your way to understanding anxiety a little bit better. Um, more recently, I've been involved in and thinking about Stoic philosophy. And read Epictetus, his, um, his handbook or his, his discourses. I think all of these have a connecting aspect, which is how do, how to act. How do you how do you convert what you want to do into what you're doing? Which is the same question I posed before about the gap between what you're capable of and what you end up doing. All of these questions, all of these books address, I think, that central question, uh, and it's it's the question that says what's the difference between the inner and the outer life of a human being. So I'd recommend Suzuki, Kierkegaard, Epictetus. To the reader with the right, to the reader with who for whom that is the medicine they need. Yeah, I, I read a decent amount of Kierkegaard in school. Yeah, and 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 yeah, there's not not everyone enjoys reading existentialism, but I think everyone should. Not not that's, necessarily like it, but they should do it. That's almost like the opening, the, the subtitle of the first chapter, shouldn't it? <laughs> no, not everyone, no one enjoys it, but everyone should. Um, no, I, I think ex the idea that you have to live your experience, which is the starting point of existentialism, is the same starting point you have in martial arts. We've all been into either boxing gyms or dojos where you kind of get the suspicion that the person teaching doesn't practice what they preach, doesn't live through this experience. And anyone who doesn't invite you to do that yourself is probably not, I, I don't want to. I don't want to sound critical of it, but it, I think the invitation to experience is part of coaching. Now, we've spent a lot of time today talking about you and your past, and, and, and we've, we've talked about a lot philosophically, but we haven't talked about the future. Sure. You did mention your, your hope to continue training and competing to an advanced age. But beyond that, let's talk about the why, I guess. You know, what is it about you know, looking out 20 years and, and wanting to continue competing that's important to you? Because when you scratch the surface of something, you do get a little bit of an understanding of its depth. And I can see that there is still more to come. There's still more layers to this to peel off, um, if that's not confusing a metaphor. The, it, it, I, I do make that my primary goal now because it informs how I do my daily practice, right? If I, if I box today dangerously and in a week's time I'm injured, the more often that happens, the, the shorter my career is going to be. Uh, if, I, 
if I, I'm, I'm going abroad this weekend, um, maybe you don't want to say that on something that's going to be edited later. Um, no, that's I, okay. I, I frequently go abroad, and in each competition, I'm making contacts for the next one or understanding who's there and what's happening. I'm always thinking about, you know, the next season and in seasons to come, who am I going to be able to box with? Um, where can I send my students? Who's good to train with? And I, I don't want to end that anytime soon. So all of my training is kind of directed into preserving that and giving myself the longest career possible. I think for the best understanding possible. Now, if people want to find you online, website, social media, you know, what do, what do you got for that that we can stick in the show notes? Okay, search for us at London Savat, almost anywhere, Facebook, YouTube, um, Instagram, uh, or londonsavat.co.uk is our website where if you want to come and train with me in London, welcome anytime. Uh, I think that's about it for online. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And and of course, anyone that might be new, we put the show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Sure. This is this has been a, a lot of fun. I, I I always enjoy having philosophical discussions with people, and I suspect that we could spend quite a bit of time chatting. Well, I hope I'm having stuff. I hope I'm giving you too much ramble that you're going to have to. Edit. No, no, I, I I love the, I love the ramble. I love the ramble, and and you know let's uh, let's get one more bit out sure. of you for everyone. Sure. You know, what, we, we kind of do the, the parting words, the words of wisdom, whatever you want to call it. So wh- how would you want to sign this episode off? What, what do you want to leave the listeners with? This kind of relates to what you asked me about looking forward to the future. It's something I say, I, I have, I'm obliged to say to students the whole time because they'll ask me on their first week, how long do I have to do this for until I'm good? And this relates to what we've been saying about self-doubt and about getting better and you know, how you change your internal conflict as you go. But my answer is always the same. If you train for one week, you get one week good. If you train for one year, you get one year good. If you train for five years, you get five years good. It's as simple as that. There's no other, there's no other goal setting. It's, they're all waypoints. So at the moment, I'm 20 years good. And, you know, I hope to be at some point 40 or 50 years good at this sport. But for me is contained in that the main motivation to train, which is to keep training. If you've been listening to the show for a while, you know that one of my favorite things is to come away from an episode with things to think about. It doesn't happen all the time, but it definitely happened today. It's been a little while since we finished the recording and I needed to take some time to contemplate really how I felt about this episode. Now, obviously I enjoyed it. It was a good conversation. But I feel like there's a lot of unfinished thoughts in my head. And as we already established on the episode, the deeper you get into martial arts, the more important these philosophical aspects are. So thank you, Professor, for coming on the show, sharing your stories, your time, and giving me a lot to think about. We've got show notes with photos and links over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Remember, this is episode 382. And you can check out all the products we make at whistlekick.com. Don't forget the discount code. Podcast 15 gets you 15% off. And if you can help us out by making a purchase or sharing an episode, leaving us a review somewhere, we would appreciate any or all of that. Personally, I would very much appreciate your help. Find us on social media. We are at Whistlekick, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. And you can get to me directly, Jeremy at Whistlekick.com. I love hearing feedback. Thank you for your time today. And until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>